Next, let's move on to the structures of ionic solids, which somewhat surprisingly, from a symmetry point of view, have quite a bit in common with the structures of metallic solids. So one way for describing the structure of an ionic solid is to take the following approach. Let's treat the anions as adopting a close-packed arrangement, either a cubic close-packed arrangement or a hexagonal close-packed arrangement. Within that arrangement, we saw that there are some voids. About 26% of the space in a close-packed arrangement is voids. And we're going to describe the structures of ionic solids by putting the cations into those voids. And as we will see, there's two kinds of voids in a close-packed arrangement. Some of the voids or holes are called octahedral holes because the environment around them is that of an octahedron, six anions surrounding the cation. Other holes are called tetrahedral holes. And in those voids, the cation is surrounded by four anions in a tetrahedral coordination. But before we go too far, let's just stop for a minute and say, does it make sense to think about the bonding in this sort of way? And what do I mean by that? In an ionic structure, we want the anions and cations to be close to each other, but we want to keep the ions of the same charge far apart. When you think about that, why on earth would the anions want to close pack? That would be like putting them as close together as possible. So I'm going to direct you to this paper by Mike O'Keefe for the full story on this. But let me just give you the too long didn't read version. Basically, the arrangement of spheres in a box is the same if we want them to be as close together as possible as it would be if we want them to be as far apart as possible. So if they're as far apart as possible, they might not be touching, but they would still adopt this arrangement, which is the same pattern as a close-packed arrangement. If we constrain the volume of a box and we say, okay, now put these anions as far apart as possible, we don't want to put a bunch of them in a corner and then one or two far apart from all of them. We want them to be equally spaced. And that equal spacing arrangement is going to be symmetrically equivalent to a close-packed arrangement. So that's basically the answer. Putting the ions as close together as possible is the same pattern as putting the ions as far apart as possible. And let me be clear, in ionic structures, the anions do not touch each other. Right? That's not the point. We're trying to keep them far apart. But there are these symmetric voids where the cations can go and we do generally think about the cations and anions touching each other. All right, let's take a closer look at what I mean by these holes. So here I've got a very small snippet of a close-packed layer. Let's say it's anions. In many ways, we could describe these structures as a close-packed array of cations with anions in the holes. But conventionally, that's not what we do. So we've got this anion close-packed layer. And now let's put some cations on top of the layer. So we can put the cations in a couple of places. The blue circles over here on the left represent one set of voids where we could put a cation. Uh, the red circles over here are a different set of voids. Let's look at the blue voids first. So if we put a cation everywhere there's a blue circle, okay, Notice that now it's nestled up against three anions, which are on the layer below it. And they make a triangle. And then if we put another layer on top, that also has three anions that are going to nestle up against that cation in a triangle that's pointed in the opposite direction. So the coordination of that black cation is going to be a trigonal antiprism. And in fact, it's going to be a very specific trigonal antiprism, which is an octahedron. So that's the octahedral holes. Notice that if you were to make a more extended array of that, the number of voids, the number of those blue circles, and the number of anions in the layer below are the same. So the number of octahedral holes in a close-packed array of anions is going to be 
equal to the number of anions in the array. Okay, now let's look at the tetrahedral holes. So we've put the cations now into a different set of depressions on that close pack layer. We still have three neighbors below, a triangle of anions that are nestled up against that cation. But the difference is now when we put the layer on top, it's going to go directly over the cation. So we have a triangular base, and then we have one neighbor on the layer above. That is a triangular-based pyramid, which is basically a tetrahedron. Now the cation in this case is going to be sitting closer to the bottom layer than it is to the top layer so that we can make all four distances equal. We could also start with that same bottom layer of anions, put cations right on top of the anions, which at first might seem counterintuitive. Why would you want to put them on top? But you could. And then when we put the next layer of anions above it, a triangle would be on top of it. So now we have a triangular base of neighbors above it and one neighbor below it. Well, that's just a tetrahedron too, but the tetrahedron is now pointing down. So we call these the tetrahedral plus holes and the tetrahedral minus holes. And the most important thing to get from this is that there are twice as many tetrahedral holes in one of these structures as there are octahedral holes. Okay, so with that basic idea, we can come up with descriptions of many ionic structures by doing two things. Either we're going to fill the octahedral holes, or we're going to fill the tetrahedral holes. And we're going to get different structures depending on whether we start with a hexagonal close packing of anions or a cubic close packing of anions. So let's look at the top row of this table. If we fill the octahedral holes, all of them, and we start with a hexagonal close packing of anions, we get a structure that's called the nickel arsenide structure. If we fill all of the octahedral holes and we start with a cubic close packed arrangement of anions, we get the sodium chloride structure. Notice in both cases the stoichiometry is one cation per one anion because the number of octahedral holes is equal to the number of spheres in the close packed array around it. Now if we have to come down to the next to the last row of this table to find what happens when we fill the tetrahedral holes. So if we try to fill all of the tetrahedral holes and we have a cubic close packed arrangement of anions, we get the structure of lithium oxide. So this is called the antifluoride structure. It's called the antifluoride structure because if we were to reverse the anions and cations, that is if we were to make a cubic close packed array of calcium ions and then put fluoride ions in the tetrahedral holes, we would get the fluoride structure, CaF2. The fluoride structure and the lithium oxide structure symmetrically the same, but we've switched the position of the cations and anions. If we were to try and fill all of the tetrahedral holes in a hexagonal close packed array of anions, that structure is not known. And to show why, let's go over to the next slide. So here I have some of these structures I just talked about. Remember that a cubic close packed array of atoms just gives the face-centered cubic unit cell with atoms at the corners and the faces of the unit cell. So if we think of those as the chlorine atoms, it turns out that the octahedral holes are on each of the edges of the unit cell. So this is the sodium chloride structure. If we have an HCP array of anions and fill all the octahedral holes, we get this nickel arsenide structure. Now, one of the interesting things that we see is in the nickel arsenide structure, in the basal plane, we have edge-sharing octahedra. And as we go from one layer to the next, those octahedra share faces. In the sodium chloride structure, although not immediately obvious from this picture, but we have only edge-sharing octahedra. So you will find examples of the sodium chloride structure for ionic compounds like sodium chloride, like sodium fluoride, 
also for things that are um, not very ionic. It's a whole gamut of kinds of substances that take this structure. The nickel arsenide structure, however, you will not find for really very ionic compounds. And the reason why is because when two octahedra share a face, it brings the cations rather close together. And that's unfavorable if the cations have a large positive charge. So nickel arsenide structure, not seen for highly ionic compounds, more for things that are, have quite a bit of covalency. Sodium chloride structure, seen for a wide range of compounds. If we go to fill the tetrahedral holes, see we already talked about this lithium oxide structure. And so here, once again, we have oxide ions at the face center positions. And then in each quadrant of the unit cell in the tetrahedral hole, we put a lithium ion. Now, if you were to try and do this for a hexagonal close packed array of oxygen ions, you would see that by filling all the tetrahedral holes, we would get face-sharing tetrahedra. And in a face-sharing tetrahedron, the cation-cation distance is actually shorter than the anion-cation distance. And of course, that's highly unfavorable. So this structure is not seen for any combination of elements. Now then, we can also get a large number of structures if we fill only some of the holes. And what I show on the right here are the structures that result when we fill half of the tetrahedral holes. If we do that for a cubic close-packed array of anions, we get what's called the sphalerite or the zinc blend structure. Uh, this is a really important structure for uh, many semiconductors. If we do it for a hexagonal close-packed array of anions, we get the wurtzite structure. So we've talked about some of the entries on the table. We talked about the bottom two rows. We talked about the top row. But then let's talk about some of the structures we get from filling varying levels of the octahedral holes. Now, let's say we want to fill half of the octahedral holes. You can do that in a very, shall we say, symmetric way. Um, and that would give you the calcium chloride structure. Or you could do it in a way where in some layers you fill all of the octahedral holes, and in other layers you leave the octahedral holes empty. This is a kind of a very asymmetric way to do it in a lot of ways. That'll lead you to structures like cadmium iodide and cadmium chloride. If we take a closer look at those structures, here is what they look like. You can see that the layers themselves, where all the octahedral holes are filled, are these infinite layers of edge-sharing octahedra. And then you can see from these drawings below, then you have basically something like a void where the octahedral holes are completely empty. Okay, and so these lead to structures like cadmium chloride, which is a cubic close-pack array of chloride ions, or cadmium iodide, which is a hexagonal close-packed array of iodide ions. These structures, and many like them, are inherently layered structures. Um, so these days there's a lot of interest in two-dimensional materials, and these structures inherently have two-dimensional electronic structures. You might ask, in an ionic compound, what kind of bonding would lead you to put all of the cations filled in some layers and empty in others? Because when you do that, you are not maximizing the separation of cations. And that fact is a kind of a clue that these structures are not truly ionic structures. What holds the layers together typically is dispersion forces. So we oftentimes have large polarizable anions like iodide, bromide, chloride, selenide, things like that. Uh, and then the cations that go in here are oftentimes form reasonably covalent bonds with the anion because that means that the anion doesn't have that much of a charge. It's not really a fully ionic compound. Now we can get a different stoichiometry if we fill even fewer holes. So let's say that we take a layer and fill two-thirds of the octahedral holes. Then you get this sort of honeycomb looking structure. If you think about each octahedron as an atom, this would be the 
uh, arrangement of atoms in graphene. So it's kind of like a graphene arrangement of filled octahedral holes. And then if in the layer above it, we leave it completely empty, well, now you have a packing that's two-thirds filled empty, two-thirds filled empty. And so if you average that, it's like filling one-third of the octahedral holes. And so the stoichiometries of these structures are one cation to three anions. So bismuth I3 is the structure that results when you have a hexagonal close-packed array of anions. And yttrium chloride is the structure that results from a cubic close-packed array of anions. Now, it's kind of interesting to go back to the nickel arsenide structure, which I told you is all of the octahedral holes filled and a hexagonal close-packed array of anions. And I told you that this structure, which we see on the left here, is not seen when the bonding becomes too ionic. And the reason why is because we have these infinite chains of phase-sharing octahedra. On the other hand, if we leave some of the octahedral holes vacant, one-third of the octahedral holes vacant, we get these graphene-like Swiss cheese layers. And if we were to pack these up in the same kind of pattern, so hexagonal close packing of anions, you would get the corundum structure, right? So corundum is the mineral name for aluminum oxide, Al2O3, which is a pretty ionic compound. We also find this for hematite, Fe2O3. That also has the corundum structure. So why is it that we can get this structure in compounds that have a fair amount of ionicity? And the reason why is because of these vacancies. So now, instead of having an infinite column of face-sharing octahedra, we have a pattern where we have filled, filled, empty, filled, filled, empty. And because there are these empty octahedral holes, the cations in the filled octahedral holes can move away from each other toward the empty space. And we can see that if we were to look at the mineral corundum and at the bond distances here. So you can see at the shared face, the aluminum oxide distances to the, is 1.96 angstroms, whereas the aluminum oxide distance to the bonds above it would be 1.86. So we can see that the aluminum ions are moving away from each other toward the vacancy that's above and below this dimer, and uh, that alleviates the unfavorable ionic interactions of the shared face.